Hi, welcome back. I'm Pam Fox, and this is the final day of my Drink Your Smoothies Challenge, where I'm sharing seven of my favorite smoothies that I make in the Vitamix. Um, my name is Pam Fox. You can find out more about me at pamfox.org in the About tab. Um, so this week I decided to do my favorite smoothies, my favorite smoothie recipes. And all of the smoothies, all of the seven smoothies except for two, are a banana base, right? Bananas and something else. Yesterday I did the Three's Company smoothie, which was bananas and spinach. Um, mm -hmm. Two of the recipes, however, do not include bananas. I showed you my, my hot date a couple of days ago, and today I'm going to do a rice smoothie. Now, I got this recipe several years ago from a YouTuber that I follow who is Korean, and she actually just mentioned, she didn't even like share the recipe. She just mentioned that this is something that she's always had since she was a little girl. It's a smoothie made of leftover rice. And I thought, that sounds kind of weird, but I, one day I had some leftover rice and I kind of tried to remember the ingredients that she threw in. It's a really simple recipe. It's really just rice and water. And from there you can add in dates to sweeten it if you want to. You can add in the vanilla drops if you want to. Um, and then some kind of nut to give it a little bit of nutty creaminess. Um, and that's it. If you wanted to do a plant-based milk, you could do that, but I just do water. And anyway, when you put it in the blender and you activate those starches in the rice, it makes a really, really creamy, a wonderful textured smoothie. It's really different. Um, the thing I will warn you about this rice smoothie is you really do need a Vitamix for this unless if you have a semi-high power um, blender, that will work. You'll want to put the rice in. Let's just go ahead and do it, and I'll kind of talk as I go. I've got about a, I don't know, about a cup of rice here. I'm going to put almost all of that in. We might end up adding the rest in, but I'll tell you why it's important to kind of, to kind of play this by ear. With the rice, when those, when those starches are activated, I'm going to put in a palm full of water. It really can bog down your motor. <laughs> And you don't want to burn out your motor. And you'll know when it does because you'll start to smell like a heat coming from your motor or you'll hear it kind of making a, a labored sound. So that's coming from a high-powered blender. It can, that can happen. And so a couple of ways you can remedy this is what you can do. This is so I've got two dates. Actually, I'm going to put three dates in there, about a little less than a cup of water, a palm full of walnuts, and you can use any nut. And this is just some water that I already heated up. I am going to fill this. I'm going to add about the equivalent of a mason jar of water in there. And then we're going to blend it. And if it starts to make that kind of bogged down sound where the motor kind of goes and you can tell it's really laboring, at that point I would add more water because I would know there's not enough water in there and it, the motor's working too hard. But if you don't have a high power blender and you want to try this, just let this sit. Let this sit for about 15 to 20 minutes, probably no more than a half an hour, and then blend it. And, and you should be fine that'll soften everything up and it should it should help I don't know if I, I don't know that for certain I'm just guessing so let's go ahead um, and blend this up I've got my blender back over here on the counter but that's okay tried this I put a lot of rice and not a whole lot of water and it really burned out my motor you can kind of smell it and hear it and so I just turn it off really quick but so here we go I'm gonna give this I don't know if it's too hot I'm gonna add in oh see it's, it's that wonderful it reminds me of rice pudding is what I was trying to say for I'm gonna put in a few of these and you could put in a little bit of actual vanilla in this as well um, you could put in a little bit of cinnamon, 
to give it more of like, I don't know, more like an eggnog flavor. Oh, and that's perfect. Okay, so here we go. Rice smoothie. Looks like milk. And again, oh, look at that. <laughs> Perfection. Again, you know, if you do like it thicker, you could add less water to rice ratio to make it a little bit creamier. That's perfect in my estimation. It's always important to wash your Vitamix or your blender as soon as you're done using it, especially something like this. Or you're going to hate yourself later. <laughs> All right, so all of the recipes for these seven recipes are in the description box below. Uh, this, this is great for, again, um, this has got quick energy and endurance energy in it from the dates, the nuts, and the rice. We talked about that yesterday. We are going to talk a little bit more today in the starch solution, but this, this is great for um, if you know you're going to have a long, busy day, if you know you're not going to, maybe you're having an early breakfast and you're not going to be able to have lunch until... You know, maybe there's going to be a six or seven hour window before you can eat again. This is great. Um, and then take fruit to snack throughout the day if you do get hungry. But this is pretty filling. I mean, it's a cup of rice and a palm full of nuts in a couple of dates. So it's not going to fill you up for the entire day, but it's pretty good. And the, and the flavor, I really enjoy the flavor. I really got into these back when I first heard about them. I used to... I used to always trying to figure out more ways I could cook with rice so I'd have leftover rice. And then it finally occurred to me, I could just make rice and make the smoothies. I don't have to have leftover rice. And you can use any kind of rice. I mean, not any kind, but I've used brown rice, short grain rice, long grain rice, basmati rice. Probably the only rice I haven't used would be like a wild rice. Um, but all the rest work great. It all tastes wonderful. So, and a brown rice is good because you've got, you know, more of the nutrients in there. But, okay, so... I just wanted to finish up this week. We talked a little bit about um, one of my favorite diets, Rotel 4, which I only did for nine months because I didn't find it sustainable. I then switched to the starch solution um, and adopted a, many of the principles in this. And kind of now I do really a combination of those two diets. And that's what works for me. And I think each of us kind of has to figure out what, what works for us. I'm of the opinion that plant strong is best for most of humanity, while there might maybe some exceptions. That's my opinion. Um, I talked a little bit about that yesterday. If you think about like in the animal kingdom, how each species has their own species specific diet, right? Like if you were to, like felines, for example, if you were trying to feed your cat like a vegan diet, they wouldn't last very long. That's my understanding. They wouldn't last very long because their digestive systems were made, their teeth, they're, 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 they're meant to eat uh, meat, they're carnivores. Um, and each, spe each species has their own kind of species specific diet where if they stick to that diet, they do well. And if they don't, dogs, for example, domesticated dogs, oftentimes, you know, their owners will give them a lot of junk food and they'll, ha they'll get these different illnesses like diabetes and whatever. Dogs are actually, um, they're actually omnivores. They can eat a variety of foods. Um, and then you have your scavengers like pigs and seagulls and rats. You know, they can eat just about anything. And th those different animals were designed for a certain, for a reason. Like the, the carnivores, you know, they, they help keep that delicate balance within nature. And the herbivores do the same in terms of plantation, in terms of plants. And, um, you know, and the scavengers, they clean things up because they can eat anything. Humans... We're omnivores too. We, our digestive systems, our teeth, we really can eat a variety of foods, which is great, but we really do thrive on a plant strong diet in general. I always say in general, because there's always going to be those anomalies where, you know, a particular person is thriving on a high fat diet or whatever and, and can't tolerate certain types of fruits and vegetables. So those do exist. Um, I know whenever I work with clients as a health coach, I always, I, typically when I work with people, it's to help them transition to a plant-based diet because that's what they want to do. But sometimes that's not why they're working with me. They're working with, with me for other digestive issues and maybe they don't want to do a plant-based diet. So we talk about some of the different options and really look at the pros and cons of different diets and then just try it. Just try it out. Um, 
you don't know until you try. That's the only way you really know how a particular diet's gonna affect your body is to try it. So, all right, so I just wanna finish up. There's such good stuff in this book. Um, I just wanna read and go through a little bit more of this first chapter. And there's so much great information in this book. Um, but this, the final part of this chapter is really just kind of give, um, offering more information on why a, a starch-heavy diet or a plant-heavy diet, you could call it either way. Again, your plants all have starch in them. Some are just more starchy, others are less starchy, like a potato. That's one of the most starchy foods you can probably imagine, um, you know, and grains and beans and things like that, and pasta. Um, but all plants have starch in them. Just like all plants have carbohydrate, all plants have fat, all plants have protein. They've got it all. That's why they're so wonderful. Um, but uh, so here's some more information on why a plant strong or a starch strong diet is so beneficial for your health. Um, with the exception of wealthy aristocrats, humans throughout history have derived most of their energy from starch. Life began to change with the colossal wealth created during the Industrial Revolution of the mid-1800s. As we began to successfully harness fossil fuels, millions and then billions of people began to eat from tables heaped high with meat, fowl, and dairy, foods that previously were eaten only by royalty. You can, and, not, and the, he's not saying they're the only royalty ate meat, dairy, and eggs, but the wealthier people um, could afford those richer foods because had money right and and the peasants would just eat what they could glean from the fields and the fruit trees or what they could grow in their garden um, and they could buy cheap food like you know like grain or you know rice or things like that um, so foods that were previously eaten only by royalty you can easily see the result we've inflated to resemble the rotund images of aristocrats and that's the other thing too you would see these aristocrats or these wealthies or these royalty people, they would have more disease, they would be fatter um, than their peasant counterparts, even though they could afford doctors. When we consume too much fat, the body looks for a place to store it, typically in the belly, buttocks, and thighs. The fat you eat is the fat you wear, quite literally. And they've actually done, you know, where they've taken cross-section fat samples from humans and analyzed it and found, you know, actual fat <laughs> it's kind of strange to think of this, but it's also quite obvious. They found actual fat from a pig, for example, or from a fish, for example, or from, you know, a cow or whatever, because that fat, they ingested it. The actual literal fat of the cow that was on the meat went into the body, and then the body finds a place to store it if it can't burn it, because it's only going to burn as much as it needs to burn, right, to meet your metabolic needs. The rest is going to be stored away into fat cells. And your fat cells can only hold so much. They can stretch and then they overflow. And then you start to see fat in places. You see very large overflowing fat cells and you start to see fat in places where it not, isn't necessarily supposed to be, like around your organs and in your blood and so forth, in your lymph. Um, and so if you're eating more fat than the body is meant to consume it has to figure out a way to store it if it can't burn it and that and that those store those fat storages were put in our body for emergency right for when we are in a time of famine for when we go into winter and and these foods aren't as readily available for when we you know for those times when we need to dip into alternate fat um fuel sources the body can turn and burn the fat on our bodies if we're not getting the food that it refers the body prefers um, to get its energy from the food that we eat. When it has to go through the, the metabolic process of burning fat, it's a much less um, efficient and easy process to burn the fat as opposed to burn the, the, the fuel that's in the food that we eat. Okay, so, so the fat you eat is the fat you wear, quite literally. Starches provide, mm -hmm. so starches provide energy and, a, and an abundance of nutrients without being stored visibly as fat. So do you hear that? The starches in the plants that you eat are um, provide energy and an abundance of nutrients without being stored visibly as fat. Um, quite the opposite. The fuel, they um, starches fuel us with proteins, essential fats, vitamins, and minerals that make our bodies run like the efficient machines they were meant to be. Starches are a clean burning fuel with just a small fraction, one to eight percent of their calories coming from fat. So again, all plants have fat in them. A lot of people don't realize 
that. And a lot of people ask me, where do you get your fat on a plant-based diet? Or where do you get your protein on a vegan diet? The protein and the fat are in the plants. They're just at a much lower dose than say in an egg. Egg is high in fat. Chicken is high in fat. Fish is high in fat. Steak is high in fat. But rice is very low in fat, but there's fat in there. Some plants have higher fat content than others, like nuts, avocados, coconut, olives. But for the most part, they're very, they have a small amount of fat because our bodies only need a small amount of fat. Um, so they also have, they have an insignificant amounts of cholesterol, that's plants, unless they have come into contact um, with cholesterols from animal-based or tissue, they do not harbor pathogens. Okay, let me read that again. Um, unless they have come into contact with them from animal waste or tissue, they do not harbor pathogens like Salmonella, E. coli, or mad cow prions, agents causing bovine spongiform and cephalopathy, right? So when you start to hear about things like E. coli, um, mad cow, you can tell this book is kind of old, but, but that was a big deal back. I remember that, the whole thing about mad cow when I was a kid. Um, they were feeding cows cow parts <laughs> and the cows would get very very sick because cows have a species species specific diet right they eat grass and hay that's what their digestive system was designed for so you start start feeding them something else they go crazy they get sick and then if we eat that meat it can make us sick as well um, and so when it comes to eating these different you know um, you know eggs for example or pork fish you know there are there are risks involved with eating those foods. Are there risks involved with eating plants? Usually not. I mean, if you're unless you're talking about, you know, eating a poisonous plant, um, some people, their digestive systems are in a state of disrepair and they have a difficult time digesting certain plants. That does happen. But that's not necessarily the plant's fault. That's because we have an imbalance or an injury or an illness within the digestive tract. And so... It's just trying to point out here that when it comes to the difference between your animal foods and your plant foods, there's a lot of risks when it comes, besides the fact that they can make you fat and clog your arteries, you know, that kind of a thing. They have other risks as well, like salmonella and so forth. And you can have, and you can have salmonella on plants too. I understand that. It just depends on where you get your plants, how well you wash them and so forth. So I understand that. Um, but in general, um, the plants themselves don't come with those risks. It says um, they don't store up poisonous chemicals from the environment like DDT or methylmercury. And I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but when they, when they test animals from the sea, for example, a fish, um, and they look at um, the cells of the fish, of the flesh, they find these chemicals in there and they find them, what's the word, concentrated. They find them very concentrated and they believe that that's because, like a, a salmon or a trout, for example, it's because of the food chain within the ocean. So from the very smallest level to the highest level, you know, big fish eats a smaller fish, eats a smaller fish, eats a smaller fish. Those chemicals, they bioconcentrate within, um, within sea life. And so, um, and so if you if you tell yourself whenever you eat seafood, it's like, oh, it's a small risk. It's a small risk that I could be poisoning myself. Yeah, I guess if you just eat seafood extremely occasionally, it might risk but it's still a risk and if you eat it uh, frequently it's going to increase your risk so so keep that in mind as well you really have to be attentive pay attention and be careful about what you put in your body that includes the food you eat beverages medications water in your body and on your body right all of these beauty products this multi-billion dollar you know <laughs> beauty um industry that just takes our money like a bunch of suckers for these beauty products and we don't know what's in that stuff and we slather it on our head and on our body. Um, we really need to start being more careful about what we put in our body and on our body. Um, so going on, unless they become, um, so I'll repeat, they don't store chemicals that is plants from the environment like DDT or methylmercury unless they become contaminated by pesticides directly introduced by the farmers. But starches are squeaky clean, Dr. McDougall says. Some starches, like potatoes and sweet potatoes, are complete foods. That's so exciting. That, you know what that means? That means you could go on an all-potato diet for probably a year, maybe even more, 
and you would not be deficient. You would get everything you need from those potatoes alone, which sounds crazy, but people have done it. You can go on YouTube. There's someone that kind of went viral and became kind of famous for going on a year long potato fast for a whole year. And he talks about the extreme, profound, the significant changes that his body went through in terms of his health, weight loss, energy gains, healing from disease. Um, I think, I can't remember his YouTube channel, but just, just Google man goes on year long potato fast. I think he's the spud man or something like that. I can't remember. I don't follow him. I just know about him and others have done the same. They've gone on, you know, shorter potato fast. So you can do a Google search or a YouTube search and find out more about that. But potatoes are a complete food. So even if you're eating, if you love potatoes, try it, try like a month long potato fast. You'll probably get tired of potatoes. I probably would if that's all I ate. There are a variety of potatoes between the yams and the sweet potatoes and the gold potatoes and the russets and the purple potatoes, the um, golden Yukons. There's a really a variety of potatoes. And just because you're on a potato fast doesn't mean you can't use different herbs or non-starchy vegetables, you know, as a side dish. Um, you could just do like a potato strong fast to see how you do um, to really test out this idea of starches and how they can impact your health. Um, you don't want to be putting butter and sour cream and cheese and bacon on your potato. That's the thing. You have to figure out an alternate way to, to flavor your potatoes. And there's really a lot of options out there to do that besides just eating plain potatoes. I couldn't do that. I like to have a lot of flavor. Um, by eating these foods alone, that is potatoes and sweet potatoes, you will easily meet your basic nutritional needs with the exception of vitamin B12. And we talk, I keep taking my glasses off because I've got this new studio light and the reflection is driving me crazy. But um, we talked about this yesterday. Vitamin, vitamin B12, short and simple, it's a microbe in the soil that's very beneficial for human health. And in general, it's becoming more and more deplete because we're not taking care of our soil, which is something we really need to make a priority because if we don't take care of our soil, how are we going to grow food into the future if our soil becomes more and more deplete? But as the vitamin B12 becomes more and more deplete because of conventional modern day farming practices, then we suffer from that because it's not in the food or on the food that we eat. Um, so if you grow your own food and you amend your own soil and all your, your garden is organic, don't be so particular about scrubbing your food to death. Leave a little bit of that dirt on there. That's where you'll get your B12. And if you can't, just take a supplement most vegans um, do a vitamin B12 supplement, but really it's suggested that people across the board, regardless of your diet, supplement with vitamin B12 because of this issue of it becoming wiped out. It's becoming wiped out because of conventional farming practices. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I'll say about vitamin B12. Grains and legumes aren't quite so complete as potatoes. So grains, your wheats and your, you know, and your, and your um, legumes, which are your beans and lentils and peas, they're not quite as complete as potatoes, but, add a, but if you add a small dose of vitamin A and C by eating a little fruit or green and yellow vegetables, you've got everything you need. So there's your balanced diet where you're eating a variety of colors of plants. You're going to get really the general consensus is from all of the plant-based doctors that I follow is if you're concerned about going on a plant-based diet and maybe it being unhealthy, if you're eating in abundance, which means you're meeting your caloric needs, you're not starving yourself or restricting your calories, if you eat in abundance and a variety of plant foods, right? So you're eating plenty of plant foods and you're eating a variety of plant foods, which is to say, you know, on your plate, you've got a variety of color, um, then you're most likely going to meet your nutrient needs by getting in enough calories and having that color and variety. And so you don't have to be all weird about tracking everything that you eat and logging everything that you eat to see, you know, how you're doing. But if you really want to do that, there's a website called chronometer.com where you can do just that. You can plug everything you eat in a day and it'll give you a complete breakdown of your nutritional, of the nutritional value of the food that you ate. And you can see exactly how well you're doing, how much protein you got, whether or not you met those different uh, so-called requirements for different vitamins and so forth. And most people find as long as they're eating enough calories, right, they didn't just have like one potato for breakfast and a cucumber for lunch and that's all they ate. You know, as long as they're meeting their caloric needs, they will find that they'll exceed those daily requirements for nutrients. They'll far exceed it. All right. So 
no animal protein or dairy need be added for excellent and complete nutrition. So in other words, when you're on a plant-based diet, you don't need the animal protein and the dairy in order to have complete, um, uh, to meet your basic nutritional needs. Starches aren't just good for you. They're also satisfying, you guys. And this is really the cool thing. When I eat something like this, starchy, rich in starches, it's pretty darn satisfying. But potatoes I find to be the most satisfying. If I really fill up on potatoes, like if I broil up a whole pan of french fries and just eat that for dinner <laughs> with some herbs and spices on it, which I love. Um, and yeah, I dip it in ketchup, which I know isn't that good for me. But you can make your own healthy ketchup if you're worried about that. I just buy an organic ketchup from the store. Um, or I just eat them plain sometimes and they're good that way too. But Or I dip them in my lemon tahini sauce, which is really good that I make myself. Um, they're so filling. I, I literally sometimes experience a bit of euphoria when I really fill up on potatoes. They're like, I get a little potato high from them and I'm not exaggerating. Um, and they're so satisfying. Like you really can just like fill up and be satisfied. There's something about potatoes that are very satisfying if you eat enough. Um, so they're satisfying the abundant carbohydrates and starches stimulate the sweet taste receptors on the tip of your tongue where gastronomic pleasure begins. Eat enough starches and your body will release hormones to go through neurological changes that ensure long-term satisfaction. So that explains it a little bit. Uh, they're naturally great taste and nourishing calories and the good feeling they give us during after eating them, that's so true, are the reasons we prefer or we, ref or, um, to, we prefer to eat Bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, corn, and beans as comfort foods. It's well accepted that starches are a great source of abundant calories, providing the energy, providing the energy athletes need to do everything from throwing to extreme skateboarding to running marathons. With all those efficient calories, you would think that starches would promote would promote excess weight gain, but they don't. They're not fattening, guys. It's what you put on them that's fattening. It's the oil and the butter and you know the egg and the all that stuff, um, the cheese, that's what makes them fattening. You would think that starches would promote excess weight gain, but they don't. And by the way, if you're worried about this rice smoothie being fattening, check out um, Dr. Kepner's rice diet that he did back in the, I can't even remember, like the 40s or something like that, where it was a clinical trial, which means it was in the research facility where they could monitor the subjects and they were put on an all rice diet with enough to meet or even exceed their caloric needs and they still lost weight and healed from their illnesses on an all rice diet. Really interesting. Um, so uh, you would think that starches would promote excess weight gain, but they don't. That's because your body efficiently regulates the use of the carbohydrates you get from starch. And that's important. Your body efficiently regulates the use of the carbohydrates you get from starch. The body's number one preferred fuel source is the carbohydrate, the starch that's in plant foods. Those plants goes, go, go in, the digestive tract gets right to work, and it can just easily and efficiently do the job of digestion with those foods. It's very, very easy and efficient. Um, plant dairy and eggs, or meat dairy and eggs is another story. It's not as efficient, it's not as easy. Uh, even if you consume them in excess, the body will burn them off as heat and energy rather than store much of them as fat. And this is another study that was done. I don't want to get into it because it's been a long time since I've referred back to it. And there's a lot of big words that I'll probably forget how to mention. But what he's talking about here is when you even if you're eating a plant strong diet and you're not making and maybe you want to lose weight and you're not creating that caloric that deficiency that everyone says you have to create in order to lose to lose weight. Many people find that even eating excess above and beyond their caloric needs, they'll still continue to lose weight. That hasn't been the case for everybody. I follow some people, one person in particular on YouTube that went on Rotel 4, which is the same diet I went on, and she gained 30 pounds because, you know, she was told, eat as much as that because your body will just burn it off as fat, excess as fat or as, as heat. And she gained 30 pounds. So now she does the starch solution. Um, but, but there are others that have, have myself, I went on the raw till four diet and I ate as much food as I could possibly stand. I stuffed myself at every meal. Why did I do that? Well, I did it because, um, I, I did a lot of research about a plant-based diet before I tried it. And I really wanted to try it for 30 days to see if it could have the profound effect on me that it was having on others in terms of healing. 
I wanted to know if it worked or if it didn't work. I didn't want to look back at the 30 days and be like, well, I didn't really do it. I kind of did it every other day. You know, I really wanted to commit to it and see if it, what it, how it would perform for me. And within a couple of weeks, I knew that it was performing really, really well. It didn't take long. And by the end of that month, I knew that I wanted to stay on the diet long term. And so for me, I knew in my mind, I'm a, I'm a big volume eater. You know what I mean? Like my husband's not. He can have a small little portion. He can leave leftovers on his plate. No problem. He'll throw food away. Not an issue. I'm not like that. If there's leftovers, if my kids had leftovers, I always ate them. I don't like to waste. And I like to feel full. And if something's really good, I like to go back for more because it's so pleasurable, right? And that's most of us. My husband, he's the exception. <laughs> But most of us love to eat. We love to eat in volume. We like to, you know, I was talking, actually, my stepdaughter, she, she's like her dad. <laughs> she's, she doesn't really care about volume that much. She just wants a nice, simple meal that tastes good and that's satisfying, and then she's fine with that. But I would say that most of us, we like to eat, right? We like to eat, we like to eat, we like to eat. So if, you, if you're one of those, this would be a good diet for you because you really can eat till you're full. If something tastes particularly good, you can go back for more. And in general, people do pretty well if they need to lose weight. The weight slowly, I will, I will add that in. When I, when I was doing raw till four, it's not like I lost a ton of weight within a month. It came off very gradually and very, very slowly. In fact, I kept, I tracked my weight. I would weigh myself every day and I would put it in, a, 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 um, in, a, in an app. And so, you know, I had this, you know, this graph where my weight was up here. I started out at almost 200 pounds. You know, and it just gradually came down the graph like that. But over the course of like almost two years, it took me to lose um, a little close to 60 pounds, close to 60 pounds that I lost. And it took me a couple of years, but I was fine with that. It was a little frustrating that it was coming off so slow because I did have a goal weight in mind. It's like, am I ever going to get to that? I did, um, but I kept wondering, like, am I ever going to get to that? It's just so slow. But I felt really light right away, and I felt energetic right away, and I felt really good about just eating healthy and just feeling better in general. You know, like not weighed down or feeling sick and in your stomach and feeling like you need to take a nap every time you eat something. Like, I didn't feel that way. So anyway, I do want to finish this up. There's just a little bit more here, and I just think it's so important. I want to get through it. But like I said, you guys can pick up your own copy if you want. Um, or you can stick around and listen to me read this, this little uh, couple more paragraphs, or you can go to drjohnmcdougall.com where there's a lot of information on there as well. Um, so, so anyway, that's because your body efficiently regulates the use of carbohydrates you get from starch. Even if you consume them in excess, the body will burn them off as heat and energy rather than store much of them as fat. And I'll say one more thing about that. For people who... Hannah, for example, this woman I was telling you about that I follow on YouTube, who went on raw till four and gained 30 pounds. When she went on raw till four, she came from a history of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, smoking cigarettes, fad dieting, taking um, diet pills like Adderall and some of these different things to help regulate her weight, uh, yo-yo diets, starvation diets, calorie counting, portion controlling. That was her past. And so her metabolic system and her health in general was at rock bottom. It was at rock bottom when she went on the raw till four diet and gave herself permission to eat as much plant foods and as much fruit as possible. And she did gain 30 pounds. But um, she believes, and even like a couple years ago, uh, what's it called? The, the greatest, that TV show, The Greatest Loser. They actually went back and did a research. They did a test study on some of the, the contestants on that show um, that showed the majority of them put the weight back on. Maybe not all of it. Some of them all of it, some of them more than what they lost and some of them less than what they lost, but they put the weight back on and they believe because of something they coined as metabolic damage. And met, the, the idea of metabolic damage has been around for a long time. And really all it is, is this idea that you can really injure your metabolic system through things like yo-yo dieting, excessive drug use, a poor diet, which makes sense. Everything that you put into your body, your digestive tract is now exposed to it. And so, and you eat every day. So if you continue to continue to put in toxicity into that system, yeah, it's going to get injured. It's going to get inflamed. It's going to be damaged. And, and then the repercussions or the consequences of that can be a variety of different illnesses. 
Um, digestive illness is usually one of them, you know, top of the list. Things like, you know, I don't know, bloating and reflux and cramping and all that kind of constipation, that kind of a thing. But so anyway, um, if you're wondering, you know, I wonder if I could go on a plant-based diet if I would lose weight or gain weight. If you're coming from that history where your metabolic system is injured and damaged, you may have to go through a transition, a healing transition, where you do gain a little bit of weight before you lose some weight. And that's what happens for a lot of people. And when I say a lot of people, I'm just talking about people that I follow on YouTube or testimonies that I read in books or on websites where people did that. And that's what they experienced. They did gain a little bit of weight if they came from that history of metabolic damage where they had to really feed their body good, healthy food and take their body through that healing transition and really allow the body to trust you again, right? It's like if you've been starving your body your whole life, then your body gets really efficient at storing away every little bit of fat that you eat because you're always in starvation mode. And that's what the fat storage is for. It's that emergency fuel source for times of famine. So if you're always restricting your calories and starve, you know, doing like diets that cut back your calories, your body really gets more efficient at storing away fat. So if you want to lose weight you're, and you're starving yourself, you're just training your body to be better at storing away fat. And if, as opposed to training your body to be more efficient at burning fat and burning fuel in general, and as your metabolic system really gets revved up and healthy and strong, it's going to be better able to do those things. Okay, one more thing I want to read here. He says, the truth is well known. Despite the drone from big business seeking to deafen our ears to it, sound advice, sound advice to eat more vegetables, fruit, and whole grains, and less fat from meat and dairy products has been given since the 1950s. In the introduction to a 1977 report from the U.S. Senate Selection on Nutrition and Needs, Dr. D. Mark Hegstead of the Harvard School of Public Health wrote, quote, I wish to stress that there is a great deal of evidence and it continues to accumulate, which strongly implicates, and in some instances proves, that the major causes of death and dis disability in the United States are related to the diet we eat. The major causes of death and disability are related to the diet we eat. Now, I think that's so important because I think so many people have been, de have been desensitized to this idea. They continue to put toxic food into their body. They continue to be, they can't connect the dots that they're related, right? I, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was eight years old, and I grew up in a very organic, healthy, junk food free, sugar free. My mom was really strict about what we could eat, and I still got sick, even though I was eating organic meats, raw milks, farm fresh eggs from our own farm, plants grown in our own garden organically before organic was even a word. Um, you know what I mean, before it was a thing, before it was a trend. And I still got sick, not only with rheumatoid, arth rheumatoid arthritis, but with allergies, with asthma. Why is this? I've asked this question my whole life. Why was I so sick as a child? Was it just because of the meat, dairy, and eggs that I was eating? And why did they make me sick and not my brother and my sister? Was I vaccine injured? I mean, we'll never know. But when I went on the plant-based diet, all of those ailments went away. <laughs> the allergies, the asthma, the chronic fatigue, the arthritis, um, and others. They just, they went away or they, they decreased to a point where I don't even know that they're there. And the thing I want to mention about the rheumatoid arthritis, even though I was diagnosed at eight years old, I went in and out of remission throughout my adult years as well. So I would get better and then I would get worse. I would have a flare up and then I would get better. And I had a really bad flare up in my early 30s. Yeah, that lasted a couple of years, two or three years, I would say, I think close to three years. And I was under the supervision of a rheumatologist and trying some different medications and some different therapies. And I didn't want to go on an immunosuppressant. I didn't want to take a drug that was going to suppress my immune system. There was something in my mind that knew that was the worst thing that I could do. Because all my life, I've been one of those people that gets sick you know, I just get sick. I get, and when I get sick, I get so sick. Not anymore. Not now that I'm, I'm, I'm vegan, but, um, but I used to catch everything and I didn't just get a little cold. I would be down and out of work for several days and I would feel like hell and I would want to die. I would get so sick. So to me to take an immune suppressing drug just sounded like 
the worst thing that I can do. And I just really didn't want to do it, but I considered it because I was in so much pain. Um, and I, here's, I'm getting to the point. I asked my rheumatologist, what about food? Should I be changing anything in my diet? avoiding any particular foods because I'd heard like nightshades and some of these different things and you know what he said my rheumatologist who is one of the best in the area renowned rheumatologist he didn't even look up at me he was looking at my charts and he just said no no food it doesn't matter you can eat whatever you want you can eat whatever you want it doesn't it's not going to affect it and I was like really really <laughs> that didn't make any sense to me like there must be something I can eat that will help or something I can avoid that will help He's like, no, scientific research has shown and proved that there's no, there's no correlation between um, what you eat and rheumatoid arthritis. It's just an autoimmune disorder where your immune system is basically broken and it's attacking your own body. And I don't believe that at all anymore. I don't believe that at all. Autoimmune disease is where your immune system is attacking your own body, but it's for a reason. It's not just because it decided to break one day. <laughs> So anyway, when I went on the plant-based diet and stopped eating meat, dairy, and eggs, and stopped eating junk food and only ate plants, all of these issues started to resolve. So I didn't mean for this to be such a long, but I really want to get through this. Um, I'll try to keep going here. Uh, so, so this doctor, this Harvard doctor, um, is stressing that, um, that diet and disease are related um, he says, I include, he continues to quote, I include coronary artery disease, which accounts for nearly half of the death, deaths in the United States. This was in 1997, and that number has gone up significant, significantly. Heart disease is the number one killer. When I was in college, the number was about a quarter of a million a year. Now it's a half a million people a year die of heart disease. So that number just keeps going up, even though in this country we spend more money astronomically more money we spend so much money on healthcare. we should be the healthiest country in the universe with the money we spend on healthcare, and we're the unhealthiest we're the unhealthiest uh, that just makes no sense it makes absolutely no sense so he says i include coronary artery disease which accounts for nearly half of the deaths in the united states several of the most important forms of cancer hypertension diabetes and obesity as well as other chronic diseases so he's saying all of these diseases are related and being caused by the diet that we eat <laughs> which makes sense right because we're putting this stuff into our body every day it's gonna have a consequence either good or bad he says in 2002 the world health organization published a report explaining that the shift toward refined foods foods of animal origin meat and dairy products and increased fats was was behind the global epidemics of obesity diabetes and car cardiovascular disease this is a report by the World Health Organization back in 2002, 19 years ago. <laughs> um, the, the report predicted that, and we haven't made, we ha and we've only gotten worse. Cardiovascular disease has gone up since then, not down. Um, the report predicted that by 2020, which <laughs> has come and gone, two thirds of the global burden of disease will be attributable to, attributable to attributable to chronic non-communicable diseases most of them strongly associated with diet and this prediction has pretty much come true what is it saying here it's saying that two-thirds of the global burden of disease will be attributable to chronic non-communicable disease chronic non-communicable diseases are things like heart disease and cancer and hypertension and diabetes the common ailments and diseases we see in our country that are killing people and making not just killing people I mean, to me, I personally would rather live a really short life with good health than a really long life with poor health. So it's not just killing people, it's making them sick and it's, 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 it's impairing their quality of life. And it's expensive, right, to take all these medications for these diseases. But it says, by the year 2020, two thirds of the global burden will be attributable to chronic non-communicable diseases. Guys, we have people dropping off like flies in this country and around the world because of the choices, the food choices that they're making. And here last year, we shut down our country and other places in the world because of a communicable disease that has close to a 99% survivability rate. Now, does that make sense? I'm not saying one is not important, but I am saying that this is important. What you eat is important and you should take very serious, very, Consider very seriously what you're putting in your body, what you're putting on your body, 
um, and not just eat it as though it doesn't matter and as though there's no connection between the food you eat, what you put in and on your body, and your health. There is a major connection. There is a major connection. Our unwillingness to respond to this vast base of knowledge from ancient to modern has resulted in the biggest health crisis known to human humankind. Worldwide, again, this book was written. Oh, my phone's, oh shoot, somebody's here. Okay, I gotta wrap this up. Worldwide, this is really important. Really, 1 billion people are overweight and 312 uh, million obese. 18 million die of heart disease annually. All these numbers are much higher today, by the way. Uh, more than 197 million have diabetes, and half of all people following a Western diet will developing life-threatening cancers. Half. Half of all people following a Western diet will develop... Sorry. Will develop life-threatening cancers. Okay, sorry to wag here, but it's so important. Okay, here we're going to finish up here. This last paragraph. It's not just individuals who are suffering. Alongside escalating human sickness... We are experiencing environmental catastrophes that are due in large part to abandoning a diet based on starches in favor, based on plants, um, in favor of putting meat at the center of the plate. Um, as you will see in chapter six, livestock are among the top two or three contributors to every one of our most serious environmental problems, including climate change. Um, so if you want to be healthy and you're a supporter of, you know, improving the environment, plant-based is the way to go. <laughs> I gotta call this guy back. Okay. As you will learn throughout the starch solution. Oh, and I'm going to the very bottom. This is the last sentence. The starch solution can help you lose weight and feel and look better. And with no extra effort, you gotta eat, right? You might as well eat healthy. With no extra effort, help to heal the world around you, reducing global warming and making our planet healthier and more sustainable for future generations. The only way to find out if a starch-based diet holds all these promises for you is to give it a try. Oh, and now we're losing our connection. So this is a good time to wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. I don't want to reconnect.